On the track is a monthly web TV show about cryptozoology, natural history, green issues, and whatever else the team feel like making up as they go along. Enjoy. It's a new year and John is off somewhere fast asleep, having broken all of his New Year's resolutions already. And I can't think of anything to say, so here's a gorilla with a sack on its head. Oh yeah, my name's Charlotte for Lipson and welcome to another episode of on the track. Eek. Just in case you wondered where I got the footage of a gorilla with a sack on their head, I took it a couple of months ago at one of the most famous zoos in the world. In November, my family and I were visiting relatives in the Channel Islands. While we were there, we visited Jersey Zoo, founded by Gerald Durrell in 1959. It's the first time we've been there for four years, and I was very much looking forward to going again. And, only a few weeks before, the new butterfly house had been opened, and we were very impressed with it. Dr. Leslie Dickey, the CEO of Durrell, said, We really want to make the zoo a more immersive experience and bring people and animals closer together. I can't wait to see visitors' reactions as they experience these beautiful animals up close. It was very hot and steamy in the butterfly house, and most of us had to take our outer layers off, alongside me propping my glasses onto my forehead, otherwise I couldn't see out of them. The butterflies didn't shy away and flew right by our heads. One even landed on my aunt. I was able to take pictures of these as I was sure they weren't going to fly off. I got very emotional while looking at this footage which Charlotte and her family took because surrounding them were all sorts of species of butterfly including ones that I had known personally when I had been a child in Hong Kong. I think that it was being surrounded by this myriad of different brightly coloured insects, all doing different things and all having their own part in the ecosystem. That originally turned me on to the glories of the natural world and, I suppose, indirectly, to being the man who sat here in front of a microphone in a tiny village in North Devon talking to you now. And thus I think that places like this are incredibly important. Gerald Dole extolled the virtues of his extraordinarily unconventional upbringing in Greece up until his dying day. And he, like me, feel that it is incredibly important for children from a very young age to be surrounded with the glories of the natural world and that we as a society are getting increasingly divorced from the reality of what nature is and what nature means. And that if we're ever going to do anything to save this planet, the first thing that we need to do is to teach the younger generation that this planet and its inhabitants are worth saving. Here, by the way, is one of my favorites, a female Papillomemnon Agenor, for some reason known as the Great Mormon. I am very tempted to make an off-colour joke here, but it would probably be inappropriate. And me, I'm on the track at least, I'm never inappropriate. As well as butterflies, the new exhibit also had Galapagos giant tortoises. Charles Darwin visited the Galapagos Islands in 1835. He was fascinated by the different species of giant tortoise that lived on the islands. Each island had its own species and there were at least 12 or possibly 15 of them. Darwin was particularly interested in the way these animals had speciated and he 
his studies of the Galactus tortoise and the Galactus finches, which had undergone a similar process, were integral to his discovery of the theory of evolution through natural selection a few years later. Well, I promise that I don't set out to annoy people, especially not in this show, which after all is supposed to be a show about the CSZ and what we do in a pleasantly informal and slightly silly manner. However, unfortunately, a few months ago, I had people object to what I had said in my support of the young climate change activists across the world. And before that, well, we all know what happened when I fell foul of the people who believe in a flesh and blood British Bigfoot. And so I'm gritting my teeth, what's left of them, and I'm fairly certain that there are going to be people who object to Charlotte and me being supportive of Darwin's theory of evolution through natural selection. Of course we believe in the theory of evolution in the same way as we believe in the Big Bang. And furthermore, that we believe that the Big Bang took place 13.7 billion years ago. And that any idea of young Earth creationism using the mathematics of Bishop Usher is, I'm afraid, about as likely as the idea that the whole universe is balanced on the back of four large elephants who in turn are standing on the back of a large turtle swimming through the cosmic ether. But I'm in serious danger of getting depressed now at the thought of how stupid some of the people with whom I share this planet are. So let's change the subject entirely. Oh, I'm bored. What can I do about it? What about an interesting fact from Charlotte? Go on, John, ring that bell. Come on, Charlotte. What about an interesting fact? Male humpback whales participate in a heat run in order to mate with a female when she's in heat. They can get exceptionally brutal, with the males going as far as to leap onto their competitors. It doesn't take much to make me happy, and for years, whenever I've been feeling down in the dumps, I have challenged those people with me to give me an interesting fact, and those interesting facts always cheer me up. Well, as you can see, Charlotte's come up with the first of a series of interesting facts for this show. But I've also been given somewhat of a challenge. I have to respond to each of Charlotte's interesting facts with something of cryptozoological interest. So, starting off, humpback whales. Giglioli's whale is a cryptic species of whale first noted by Enrico Giglioli. Unlike every known species of whale, it is described as having two dorsal fins. Giglioli, an Italian, was director of the Royal Zoological Museum in Florence, on September the 4th, 1867, he was on board a research ship called the Magenta, about 1,930 kilometres off the coast of Chile, and he spotted a species of whale which he could not recognise. It was very close to the ship, he described it as being too close to shoot with a cannon, and was observed for a quarter of an hour, allowing Giglioli to make very detailed observations. The whale looked overall similar to a rorqual, about 18 metres or 59 feet long with an elongated body, but the most notable difference was the presence of two large dorsal fins about 2 metres or 6.6 .6 feet apart. Other unusual features include the presence of two long sickle-shaped flippers and a lack of throat pleats. Another report of a two-finned whale of roughly the same size was recorded off the coast of Scotland the following year, and in 1983, between Corsica and the French mainland, French zoologist Jacques Maigret sighted a similar-looking creature. Although it's not been proven to exist, it was given a classification, Amphitera, Pacifica by Giglioli, given the species' alleged size and attributes, it's extremely doubtful that such a species would not have been taken and reported by modern commercial whalers, bringing into doubt its very existence. However, several humpback whales in the South Pacific have been known to possess split dorsal fins, either due to deformation or wounds, so this might well provide some sort of explanation 
for this fantastic cetacean. Now that's what I call interesting. interesting. This new segment was Charlotte's idea, as was the title, with people in the CFZ spread far and wide across the globe and of all ages from their teens to their 80s. Everyone has a different opinion of their favourite mystery animals. And so now, each episode, we are asking a different crypto authority for their favourites. And as Charlotte said, It's time for the Crypto's Cryptids. OK, tell me, what's your favourite cryptozoological creature? Uh, well, I think when we go with cryptozoological creature, I'm going to have to say that it's it's the wild man. Now, I could say Bigfoot, or I could say, you know, the Yeti or any of these other kind of names, but I like the idea of the very nebulous wild man. So it could apply to the wood woos or the yaren. It's this kind of um, man-like creature that has um, a skewed civilization. It's that undomesticated side to us. It's that mystery in life. So I'm just going to go out and say the wild man. When you, it's interesting when you talk about it having a skewed um, civilization. Do you think any of the wild man reports from around the globe actually refer to creatures? who have rejected civilization, who were civilized once but aren't anymore. Yeah, I think that whenever I, I look at this in depth, I, I tend to think that when we talk about elusivity, we're talking about something that is deliberately staying away from what we would call civilization for whatever reason. Uh, they may know that, you know, they, they don't like the rules, they don't like the way that societies um, um Structured, you know, I like that idea that these creatures out there have enough intelligence to say this is not what they want, and they want something to be more in a state of grace, if you will, something more akin to that um, that Eden-like existence. And if you were, if I was to make you make a tough decision, are they what? What are they, man? Ape, uh, or something oh. completely different. Yeah, well, I, I would probably have to say that in the evolutionary process, uh, they are, you know, within, within our family tree, definitely. Um, so I, I, let, let us say that it will be something closer to um, the Gigantopithecus blocky. Uh, if, if that would be make any sense, but not that. It's some, some sort of uh, divergence that we took on the evolutionary timeline that just kept on going and didn't die out, but it still remains with us to this day, undiscovered. And so it's the time of the show that once again we go and look at the recent lake and sea monster sightings. And what we got here, we got something from Loch Ness at the end of last year. Charlotte, what do you make of that? It kind of looks like a really skinny chicken, like the ones from Chicken Run. Chickens! I'm always impressed by chickens. I have to admit that I think I agree with you. It is was taken by somebody called Ricky Phillips, who works as a guide waiting for his group of tourists to finish their cruise when he noticed a strange sight. The 39-year-old said he was sitting by the river Oich as it flows into Loch Ness of Fort Augustus, eating some chips when he heard a weird noise. And Mr Phillips, who writes history books, said it was a great creature, almost bird-like, in a grey stretch of water. Its neck was three to four feet long, a head to the size of a rugby ball, and a ridge across its eyes. I was baffled. Well, first of all, there are no birds that size living, not just living in Britain, living in Europe. And second of all, do you think we've actually discovered the elusive, giant underwater chicken? Possibly. Wouldn't it be brilliant, a giant underwater chicken? Nothing gets better than that. Not even the latest thylacine photograph. 
But you and I have looked at thylacine pictures over the years, and a lot of them, I think you'll agree with me, have been terrible. These are pictures that are purporting to be of the thylacine or Tasmanian wolf, which is the totem animal of the CFZ, the animal that many people describe as the cryptid most likely to be discovered, and an animal which did exist, there's no doubt that it existed, because this was the last one ever known, and it died in a zoo in Hobart in Tasmania in 1936. And now this picture has been taken. The interesting thing is, apart from the fact that it's in colour, it's remarkably well focused, but it doesn't look staged is that if you look close enough, and I want to say thank you to Tony Lucas for this, look here on the tail, you can see it's even got bands, it's even got stripes on the tail. Yeah. The thing that most people claim to be the uh, truth behind an awful lot of the so-called science and pictures and videos being taken is that it's a European red fox, which is now found wild across large swathes of Australia because the British brought them there um, in the 19th century for fox hunting, which was a remarkably stupid thing to do. But a lot of people claim that these pictures are of foxes with mange. And I suppose it could be said that you see those grey bits there it could, I suppose, be claimed that, that, that it's mange, that it's the pattern of sarcoptic mange. Doubt it, though. I don't think so, either. Um, you know what we ought to do? Yeah. Send the picture to Shosh. She knows all about sarcoptic mange. And we'll take it from there, and we'll be back to you next episode, hopefully with some results. Well, from a distance, when you see it small, a small, um, it looks quite interesting. But when it, it's blown up, when you see it just two, you can see it's a fox. Well, first of all, it has no stripes. But the big giveaway is the tail, because you can see remnants of the bush on the tail, which Silasines didn't have. If you look closely at the tail, it's not that thick. It's sort of got the remains of a bush on it and because it's had mange it's all fallen out but you can see the remains of the brush as regular viewers will know there is something that we've been promising you for several months now in fact more than several months and it's something that's a real treat for us all <laughs> about Max? Uh, Doctor, you, he came down just before the years and a silly little doctor forgot to bring the proper photos. Are you kidding? No, he's bought some others. I don't know what they were all. Mm. Or the trains or something perhaps? I don't know. Oh, oh. he goes. He's supposed to be sending them. Mm. But he hasn't. Boys, eh? Yeah. Now, boys now and girls, boys and girls, what do we have here? And now it's time for a brand new feature for the show. It's time for On The Track Product Placement. There are all sorts of people who are friends and relations of the CFZ and people who are members of the CFZ themselves who do all sorts of peculiar things. And now, each episode, we're going to give a brief roundup of some of these aforementioned things. Right, Weird Weekend North is back on the 6th and 7th of April 
2019 at Vixton with Glazebrook Community Hall. This year we have yet again another very strong lineup of talks. We have Dr. Rob Gandhi talking about Russington Horror. This strange and mysterious horror sighting we'll be finding more about. Steve Mayer will be talking about the connection between UFO portals and the paranormal. Andy Ross will be looking into the story of the Durham Puma, that most mysterious of feline cryptids. Christopher Joseph and Chris Hill will be talking about Jeff, the very strange and extra special talking mongoose. Nathan Jackson will be giving a lecture on BHMs the world over, looking at some of the big hairy monsters that can be found worldwide. Gwen Vaudry will be looking at the Risley Silver Man mystery. Was it an alien that turned up in Risley in 1978, or something completely different? Steve Jones will be recalling the ghost that he has met and other weird happenings that have occurred. James Newton will be looking at reports of Dogman. This upright, dog-faced Bigfoot will be uh, well worth listening to. Richard Freeman will be giving uh, a report on his expedition to Tajikistan, looking for the gull. Cal Marshall will be discussing the British big cats, hopefully providing us with some new information on this most elusive of creature. And Bob Fisher will be turning up as well, with once again one of his most interesting talks, that so far we have to keep secret. So once again, that's the 6th and 7th of April, at the Eastern Glazebrook Community Hall, and a ticket for one day is £15, for both days, it's just thirty pound. One of the best deals you'll get for any talk like this. Now it's time to go over to Karina for her regular look at the Watcher of the Skies. I have always felt a curious affinity with this species of bird, probably because for thirty years I was a secretary, and this is a secretary bird, a highly specialised ground-dwelling bird of prey from an older family than the other Old World raptors. It is native to sub-Saharan Africa and is sadly non-migratory, so will never be a natural visitor to these shores. But I think you'd be surprised quite how many completely unexpected avian visitors Britain does have, and that's what this segment upon the track is all about. Bernard Hoibermans himself said that cryptozoology wasn't the study of monsters, but the study of unexpected animals, and in the UK what could be more unexpected than vultures, spoonbills and albatrosses? Yes, even the kings of the Southern Ocean have been seen in British waters. Two species of albatross have been recorded in the UK in recent years. Not all of our feathered visitors are quite so spectacular, but nearly every day there is something exciting to greet the watcher of the skies. The dog has decided to actually ruin everything. It's really not tennis, is it? If you want tennis, yeah, you're supposed to play that outside. Excuse us, technical difficulty. Sorry, I'm sitting on it. If you 
you want your tennis ball, you'll have to somehow remove my <coughs> right buttock, buttock from it. <laughs> right. be a bit difficult. According to the RSPB, it. it is on the red list of birds of conservation concern. It is also a Schedule 1 species according to the Wildlife and Countryside Act. This means it is an offence to intentionally or recklessly disturb at, on or near an active nest. They typically forage for insects, spiders, worms, berries and seeds and tend to look for mainly urban areas like Greater London, Birmingham, Nottingham and Liverpool, Manchester and Ipswich when breeding. Some hares have been spotted at cliff sites, power stations and coastal areas between Suffolk and Dorset. In winter you will find them in coastal areas of Ireland, Wales, England and the east of Scotland. I'm sitting on it. Pish. Right. Not a rare bird visitor, this one, but the tail of an escapee that has been on the run since before Christmas. Chris Maria escaped from his home, a sanctuary near Hedley on Thames in Oxfordshire, and although he has been sighted several times, the last information found seems to indicate that he is still evading capture. At around five foot tall, flightless bird has surprised the residents on their Barat driveway, and there is a video that even shows the errant bird causing traffic and chaos. Rears are distantly related to ostriches and emus, and are good sprinters that can run at around 40 miles per hour, pack a hefty kung fu kick, although his owner says that Chris won't attack anyone unless he panics. It seems that he has no intention, though, of driving home for Christmas. Did you get that, Rear? Chris Rear, driving home for Christmas. Oh, sorry, Lily. Oh, we nearly had the cat back. A group of waxwings were spotted eating berries from a rowan tree outside the police station in Long Stratton, Norfolk. The birds are recognisable by their distinctive red and yellow feathers and are not native to the UK. They are scarce visitors here, tending to visit during winter and do on occasion appear in large numbers. A spokesman from Rare Bird Alerts went on to say that it depends on the availability of food and or weather within their winter range. It was recently revealed that a couple of rare Socorro doves hatched at Chester Zoo in November, which were raised by foster parents, a pair of Barbary doves. There are only 23 of them existing in the UK with less than two. No, you're not moving my buttock! With less than 200 living in human care in zoos around the world. The species originate from Socorro Island, located 400 miles off the west coast of Mexico, and they vanished completely 47 years ago before being declared extinct in the wild in 1972. It is thought that the introduction of sheep that ate the plants the doves depended on to survive, as well as invasive species such as cats, that preyed upon the bird are behind their eyes. Thank you, Prudence, for that nice interlude of passing wind. It gets better. Right. Let's start the next paragraph. Oh, no, no, we're still on that page. We're all right. Stop interrupting, dear. Work is currently being carried out on the island to try and create a safer area for the reintroduction of the doves in the future. Andrew Owen, the zoo's creator of birds, said zoos in Europe, the USA and Mexico have, for some time, been breeding Socorro doves as part of a globally managed program which is working to return them to their ancestral home. These chicks are significant additions to the recovery program of the Socorro dove. It's rather humbling to think they can play an important role in one day seeing the species fly around the island of Socorro once again. The addition of the birds at the Cheshire-based zoo are part of the European Endangered Species Programme, aiming to one day re-establish them in the wild. Actually, tennis balls are very good for the sciatica. You lay on one. 
Right, let's go for the next one. The North, no, Nottinghamshire. The Nottinghamshire Wildlife Trust Attenborough Nature Reserve was... Oh, sorry. <laughs> She's making it It's very windy in here this afternoon. Anyway, start again. The Nottinghamshire Wildlife Trust Attenborough Nature Reserve was host to a rare bird visitor recently. The firecrest, the joint the smallest bird in Europe, the other being its relative, the gold crest, weighs around the same as a 10p coin. They can appear similar to some, but there are a few distinguishing features that set them apart. The black eye stripe and white markings above the eye are only present in the firecrest, but the most notable difference is their bright orange crown. Firecrests are much rarer than the gold crest, and don't often visit this area of the country. 15 records of Attenborough Nature Reserve since 1974. They rarely stay still, so look out for the flash of orange that can be seen darting through branches whilst they catch insects and spiders to eat. In the past, firecrests were simply passage migrants, meaning that they would only stop in the UK during their spring and autumn migration on their way to the warmth of southern Europe and northwest Africa. The bird travels from Eastern Europe and despite its small size, crosses the blustering old sea before taking a well-earned break in the UK. However, oh. and again, however, in 1962, <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just thinking, it's to do that just after I was sort of saying blustering old sea. I think she thought that was some kind of signal. Although they haven't, I don't know what I'm saying. Oh, well, however, in 1962, however, in 1962, the first record of them breeding in the UK was made in the south of the country. Although they haven't stayed in Nottinghamshire to breed, chances are this fiery visitor could well be spending the winter with us. The last fire crest of the reserve was in 2016, and it's thought to have stayed in the area throughout the colder months. It seems that this particular fire crest has chosen the bushes along Barton Lane for its winter stay. If you want to collect and catch a glimpse yourself, head to Attenborough Nature Reserve and keep an eye out along Barton Lane just before the level crossing. However, it may well have gone by now. Classed as a mega sighting, a royal tern was spotted at the end of last year on Anglesey. It's not the first royal tern to visit North Wales. There was one in June 2009, seen on the, I have no idea how to say this, Finn Peninsula. When I say peninsula, it's Finn Peninsula. But not all royal terns are the same. It's the second largest species of tern with populations on both sides of the Atlantic. Recent studies show that royal terns nesting in West Africa are genetically distinct from those that breed from North Carolina south to Argentina, and some authorities consider them to be different species. Hello, Lily. The problem is that the birds from each population are very similar, and a Fandudno bird couldn't be assigned to one or the other. This week's Anglesey bird sports a little ring on its right leg, consistent with a ringing scheme in North America indicating it's likely Orange? Likely origin. Why did I say orange? And that is it. That is it for this episode. Now it's time to go over to Jonathan for the usual look at new and rediscovered species. And it's farewell from Mayhem. Or Bedlam.
The other day, Graham suggested to me that some of my new and rediscovered sections might be a little over-technical. I didn't say that at all. What I said was that I didn't understand it. And if you weren't careful, we were going to send the audience to the King's <laughs> And so I've decided to present them a little differently from now on. Cyclosa is a spider genus in the family Aranidae. Widely distributed worldwide, spiders of the genus Cyclosa build relatively small orb webs with a web decoration which often includes prey remains and other debris which probably serve to camouflage the spider. A new species of Cyclosa has been described under the name Cyclosa bulla using specimens collected from Thailand, Singapore and Brunei. Females of the species can be easily distinguished from other congeners by the shape of the abdomen, which has a globus posterior end. In contrast, males cannot be distinguished from those of Cyclosa bifida, which seems to be the most closely related species, even by the shape of the pulpal organ. In this study, male specimens are identified by DNA barcoding. As regular CFZ watchers will be aware, I have a particular fondness for Southeastern Asian freshwater crabs, and I'm always happy to report upon the discovery of a new species, such as Indochimon kinpii, which is the first potamid species recorded from northern Myanmar. The type locality, Malika, is a fast-flowing river, the substrate consisting of rocks of various sizes, with the bank sandy. The banks are densely lined with tall trees. This river is a branch of the Irrawaddy, or Irrawaddy River and is about 43 kilometers north of Miatka, the capital city of Kachin State. It is distinguished from congeners by its very wrinkled or ruggos carapace, broad male abdomen or pleon, and a distinctively structured male first gonopod. Gonopods are, by the way, specialist appendages of various arthropods used in reproduction or egg laying. In males, they facilitate the transfer of sperm from male to female during mating, and thus are a type of intermittent organ. In crustaceans and millipedes, gonopods are modified walking or swimming legs. Still in Southeast Asia, four species, one completely new to science, have been described from Macau, which is a tiny territory formerly a Portuguese colony in southern China. The fact that they are distinct from the crabs of Hong Kong only a few miles away, and that Macau is one of the most densely built up places on Earth, has enormous implications for cryptozoology. Carcharinus obsolaris is a new species of shark described based on three specimens from Borneo, Thailand and Vietnam in the western central Pacific. It belongs to the porosus subgroup which is characterized by having the second dorsal fin insertion opposite the anal fin mid-base. It's most closely resembled C. borneensis but differs in tooth morphology and counts and a number of morphological characters, including lack of enlarged higher mandibular pores, which are diagnostic of C. borneensis. Eek, technical alert. The historic range of this shark is under intense fishing pressure, and this species has not been recorded anywhere in over 80 years. There is an urgent need to assess its extinction rate status for the IUCN red list of threatened species. With so few known records, there is a possibility that it has already been lost from the marine environment before any understanding could be gained of its fuel, historic distribution, biology, ecosystem role and importance in local fisheries. Radinia eduarda is a new species of forest snake that has been found from converted pre-montane wet forest in the municipality of Santa Catarina Huicala in the Sierra Madre del Sur of southern Oaxaca, Mexico. It's most closely related to Radinia laureata, from which it can be distinguished easily by colour pattern and scutellation, that's the pattern of the scales, and represents a species group distinct from the other three which occupy the genus. 
two cryptic species of Chinese frog, which were previously reported to be Amlopops ricketti, are revealed on the basis of significant morphological and genetic differences. Amlopops sinensis from central Guangdong, northeastern Guangxi, and southwestern Hunan can be distinguished by the longitudinal glandular folds on the skin of the shoulders and other character combinations. Amulopops yatsani from the coastal hills of West Guangdong can be distinguished by the dense, tiny, round, translucent or white spines on the dorsal skin of the body, dorsal and dorsolateral skin of the limbs and other character combinations. Currently, the Chinese torrent frog is recognised from the Shimentai Nature Reserve in Mount Nankun in Guangdong. Mount Lumpling in Guangxi and Mount Yangming and Mount Hengshan in Yunnan, which indicates the potential distribution area of Amlopops sinensis to be from central Guangdong all the way up to southwestern Yunnan. Despite being recognised as ecologically and biogeographically important, the biodiversity of the Hengduang mountain region, particularly along the upper Mekong River, remains poorly understood. Diploderma dryadakpo, a new species of mountain dragon, a lizard in the Agama family, has been described from the headwater region of the Mekong River in Chambo, Tibet. The species is recognised as a member of the Jalapura flaviceps complex and it can be distinguished readily from all congeners by a suite of morphological characteristics including its dwarf appearance, small body size and disproportionately short tail and short hind limbs, smooth or weakly keeled ventral scales, feebly developed vertebral crests in males and by the absence of distinct gula spots in both male and female. Now from Tibet we travel to Brazil and a new species of Enialis, epidemic to the Brazilian Corrado based upon morphological and molecular data sets. In the face of uncertain taxonomy amongst museum specimens of Enialis, the research team used a novel analytical approach for species assignments. They also used machine learning classification procedure to investigate morphological variation and identify species diagnostic characters. Phylogenetic and species delimitation analyses supported the distinction of the new species from its congeners. The new species is characterised by the fewest ventral scales and smallest snipe to vent length in the genus. Moreover, we infer that this species diverged from its closest relative, E. balineatus, in the late Miocene, just over 5 million years ago. Lacuna cambarus diogenes was, until recently, considered to be one of the most widely distributed North American crayfish species, occurring in 31 US states and one Canadian province, east of the North American Rocky Mountains. Glon et al. in 2018 investigated this claim and found that L. diogenes seems to actually be a species complex. The authors re-described L. diogenes and restricted its range to the Atlantic coastal plain and Piedmont ecoregions of eastern North America. In doing so, they also revealed the existence of several probable undescribed species of Lacuna cambarus that were previously considered to be L. diogenes. These include Lacuna cambarus chimera, a large primary burrowing crayfish found in parts of the lower Mississippi, Ohio, Tennessee and upper Mississippi river basins. Lacuna cambarus chimera is morphologically similar to L. diogenes, but can be distinguished from it by the greater number of spines on part of its body, its wider antennal scale terminating in a short spine, and the presence of a single longitudinal stripe on the dorsal side of its abdomen. Also in North America, another new species of crayfish, Cambarus lochmani, has been described from the preglacial Tees River Valley of Cabell, Tanawa, Lincoln, Mason and Putnam counties in West Virginia. The species was previously considered to be part of the Cambarus dubius complex. Lochman et al. restricted Cambarus dubius 
to an orange colour more found in central and northern portions of the Allegheny Mountains and Appalachian Plateau in central West Virginia, western Maryland and south central Pennsylvania. The new species can be distinguished from all other members of Cambarus by a double row of cristiform turbicules on the palm, an open areola with two rows of punctations, oh yeah, and the fact that it's bright blue. The lungless salamanders of the tribe Bolotoglossini show notable diversification in the neotropics, and through the use of molecular tools and or new discoveries, the total number of these species continues to increase. Mexico is home to a great number of these creatures, primarily distributed along the eastern, central and southern mountain ranges, where the genus Chiroprototriton occurs. This considerable number of undescribed species, suggested by the use of molecular tools in the lab more than a decade ago. Most of these undescribed species are found in the state of Veracruz, an area characterised by diverse topography and high salamander richness. Chiroprotototriton aureus and Chiroprotototriton nubilis are two new species based on molecular and morphological data. Both new species were found in bromeliads in cloud forests of central Veracruz and do not correspond to any previously proposed species. Finally for this month, the Marajeji Massif in northern Madagascar is a constant source of herpetological surprises. This is where a new species of leaf-mimicking leaf-tailed gecko, Europlatus finartrita, has been described based on morphological and molecular phylogenetic evidence. This new species inhabits the rainforests of Marajeji National Park at low elevations and is morphologically similar to Europlatus fantasticus but differs by having a larger body size, relatively shorter tail and dark red pigmentation of the oral mucosa, the inside of the mouth. Who does it? Similar to other members of the leaf mimicking Europlatus species in northern Madagascar, Europlatus finartrita probably only has a very small geographic distribution and is currently only known from the lowland rainforests of Marajeji. In order to reduce the risk of international trade under incorrect species names, it's been suggested that exported CITES species should be obligatorily accompanied by information about their precise geographic origin within Madagascar. And although I'm sure that most of you know this, CITES is the Convention on the International Trade of Endangered Species, a piece of international law which serves to protect rare and vanishing animals. These are only a representative sample of the creatures that have been discovered for the first time this month. There were also a number of frogs and new geckos, small fish and snakes that I decided to ignore purely because of space. But I'll be back again next month with a whole lot more. Thank you for listening. I would like to also point out that whereas every effort has been made to contact the copyright holders of these photographs, we believe that we are justified in reproducing them in this not-for-profit video using the policy of fair use. However, if there is anybody who believes that their intellectual or legal rights have been infringed, please contact us and we will do our best to bring the matter to a mutually acceptable solution. It would be nice to think that Max will come up trumps with the pictures of the sturgeon from Moscow Aquarium. But we do have what happened when Charlotte met some South American bears and when Carl and his dad went to an auction of exotic taxidermy. I can't believe that it was the summer of 2017 when we actually moved on to this show. And this time has gone very, very fast. Our friend, Louis, has set up a Patreon campaign, which is a very real and sensible way that if you want to support not just this show, but the Centre for Fortune Theology, you can do so by going to the link here. And in the meantime, Charlotte and I would just like to say thank, thank you, you very much for your support. support.
I think you imagined this would be that Bruno walked into the sky as a little under here for some reason, right? but it would get boring if there wasn't a bit of chaos every now and then. But anyway, thank you for watching this episode. Despite the chaos, we hope you subscribe, click that like button, ring the bell so you get notified whenever we upload a new video, follow us on various social media, as well as following our Facebook page. Thank you and goodbye! On behalf of everybody at the Centre for Fortune Zoology, I would like to congratulate Colonel John Blashford Snell, our Life President, on his elevation to a CBE in Her Majesty's New Year's Honours List. Well, ladies and gentlemen, here we are at the end of another episode, and we hope you enjoyed watching it as much as we enjoyed making it. It was a particularly fun one to put together, even though it did get chaotic. But hey, Archie, what's a bit of chaos between friends, eh? There's a lot of things in the pipeline for the CSJ this year, so I hope you're going to come around watching throughout the year because a lot of exciting stuff is going to be coming up. I want to say thank you to everybody who's helped with this episode and to everybody who's supported us, both for this show and for the CSJ throughout the last month. Thank you guys, without your help we really couldn't do what we do. So, I'll see you all next month, and until then, from me and Archie, 